Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where every day I explore how tech is transforming both our online and offline worlds in a language that everyone can understand. So when I say NFTs and metaverse, I know from the emails that many of you still have many questions that you want to ask, and some of you might be afraid to ask them because you don't want to look foolish and out of touch. And equally, I also know many of you, even when they're armed with all the information, still scratch your head thinking, but I still don't get it. So today, I'm on a mission to put that right. Let's increase awareness, education, and adoption in this space. So after NVIDIA, Roblox, and even Epic Games with Fortnite are all building metaverses this year, for me, it it wasn't until Zuckerberg's Facebook rebrand that got everybody talking. It's in the mainstream now, folks, and even your grandparents are going to be talking about metaverse and NFTs. And since launching, a company called Terra Virtua has collaborated with numerous industry leaders such as Paramount Pictures and Legendary Entertainment, and they've been working to bring the best NFT content and collaborations to their platforms. But the brand now has big plans for growth and creating a whole new form of entertainment for their fans. So I've invited Jarad Ashraf onto the podcast to learn more. And he's been at the forefront of technology and has been leading innovation in the NFT sector since he co-founded Terra Virtua with Gary Bracey, their CEO. And But enough scene setting from me. Today's guest is always flying around the world spreading the word about everything that they're doing at uh, Terra Virtua. So buckle up and hold on tight, because I'm going to beam your ears all the way to Pakistan, where Jarad Ashraf is waiting to speak with us, share his story, and also introduce everyone listening to the world of metaverse and NFTs in a language that everyone can understand. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? So uh, my name is uh, Jawad Ashraf. I'm CTO and co-founder of Terra Virtua. We're like a NFT a marketplace and ecosystem. We were into blockchain back in 2017, where we came up with an idea of uh, having digital assets, which were NFTs, um, having VR and a metaverse. But like we realized one year into it, a little ahead of our time, and then we focused on the NFTs as phase one. And over the years, we've licensed some incredible IPs. And we brought our NFTs work with brands, which are incredibly high quality. And we're one of the leaders in the market. And uh, the interesting thing is right now, a lot of people know what NFTs are. But back in the day, trying to explain to executive about Paramount what it was, was a very interesting proposition. I bet it was. And there's still a lot of people that get very confused when you bring the subject up. And I'm looking forward to busting a few myths and clearing up a few things around that. But before we dive into the world of metaverse and NFTs, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. Can you share your origin story and and where your passion for technology came from and ultimately what it was that put you on this path you're on today? My background is that I actually um, did a degree in computer science and I spent the first uh, uh, couple of years of my life just uh, working in lots of different areas of technology. I only worked full time for two years um, before at like 23 years old, I jumped off and started doing my own businesses and became freelance. So I started in the world of kidnap and ransom and anti-terrorism, funny enough, which was slightly less fun than where I am now. Then I started spinning up different businesses. But what I've always been very interested in is new disruptive technologies, things that are going to change the world, things that haven't been done before. And um, so every time I built a tech system, so like I built the first um, CRM before Salesforce came out for example, a web-based CRM. So I moved into web technologies when people were still on the PC. I moved into mobile before people were on mobile. It's like, what's interesting and what's going to drive change? Like back in the day when people were, before um, we had e-commerce, everyone who was a retailer was going, people aren't going to come in and buy anything online. They want to pick it up. They want to smell it. They want to touch it. And all of a sudden, everyone's buying everything online. And then mobile was a big shift and everyone wouldn't use mobile and all of a sudden all behaviors are mobile. And my interest with where we are now was blockchain and blockchain technologies are 
right now to normal technology what the retailers were to e-commerce. They've got no idea what's coming. It's going to revolutionize the world. It is an incredibly exciting space. And what an amazing journey you've been on to this point. And for people listening and hearing about you for the first time, Terra Virtue is the world's first fully immersive social digital collectibles platform. And for people that are new to this space, can you set the scene and tell them a little bit more about exactly what that means? Um, What you find at the moment is that when people talk about NFTs, let's talk about what an NFT first is. That's probably setting the scene more than anything. Yeah. Um, think about back in the day. You know, you used to be able to buy a DVD, you used to go buy a CD, you used to be able to buy a book. And when you had, so let's just start with those examples. And those things were something that you could buy, you could collect, you can sell, and it had value. It was an asset. OK, so if you had a collector's edition of a book, it would be worth more than a second printing, for example. And like the first issues of Harry Potter or whatever were worth more. And they were collectible, an asset that you owned. But when things moved to digital, what's happened along the way was that people who make these things weren't able to do the transition to digital. So it opened up an opportunity for other companies to come in as providers and basically rent us everything. So if you think about it right now, let's say, let's say you think about... Um, Spotify, Apple Music, you're renting everything. If you think about um, Netflix, you're renting your movies. If you think about um, Amazon Kindle, you're locked into an ecosystem where you're effectively renting your book. You can't trade them. You can't do anything with them. And fundamentally, the NFT you can think of as that item in digital, let's say a, a, a piece of music or a movie or a book or whatever else you have, like a playing card, which is digital, but it has a certificate of authenticity on the blockchain, which says that, you know what, there's only been a thousand made of these and no more can ever be made. And if you start buying and selling it, it actually has the same sort of value as if you sold your DVD or your book, because now it's got real value. And another example would be, let's say, Somebody will say, oh, but you know what? You can just cut and paste a JPEG. Well, let's say that you buy a piece of artwork and that piece of artwork is one of a thousand. Now, you could take a photocopy of that and shove that up on your wall. It's not worth anything. And that's exactly the same issue is that when you've got a digital item, which is a piece of artwork, and let's say there's only a thousand of them and there are a thousand NFTs, thousand copies of them, each with its own digital certificate. That means there's only over a thousand of those pictures available to buy and trade and sell. And that's actually the same quality as if you bought a collector's edition, like number two of a thousand, because they have value based upon their rarity. With NFTs, digital, with digital assets like this, they all have rarity. They all have limited quantities. So you can't mass produce them and keep copying them. That's sort of what an NFT is. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, it that. really does. And it's a really exciting space for me because, yes, I, I am from that time where we all owned our media, whether it be CDs, DVDs, books, cassettes, books. We had those shelves that were gathering dust of all those items. But now, of course, all those shelves are empty. And like you rightly said, nobody owns anything anymore. We, we just rent everything and stream it. And I think for me, it's really helped people re-explore and redefine exactly what is valuable, what is collectible. And in yeah, the same, in the same way that the Mona Lisa is incredibly valuable to to art collectors, it, to other people it isn't. And it's just redefining that, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the thing about it, because um, it's bringing the qualities of your physical back into your digital. Right now, digital is more relevant to up-and-coming generations than physical ever was. But... They should have the ability to own what they have instead of it just being rented. And also the great thing about this as well, about NFTs, is that when you sell them on, the creator can actually get paid back a small royalty. So let's say that you wrote a book and somebody bought the book and then they sold it 20 times. Or an artist makes a great piece of artwork that they sell for like £500 at the beginning and then by the end of it, it's reselling for a couple of million. They never see any of that. But what you can do with digital items is built into the contract. So every time you sell it, the person who created it gets a little bit back. So that's actually reinvigorating the community for creators instead of marginalizing them, which is sort of happening at the moment. They're becoming commodities. And that's 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 why people you see so much in the fringe movement around NFTs and all this weird and wonderful and wacky artwork coming up. And you see everyone buying them and collecting them and things because they're able to monetize their uh, their artwork and their creativities in ways that you can't anymore 
Right now, galleries have monopolies, and um, once it's sold on once, they never see a dime. And that's all changing with NFTs. And what I find really interesting is it really seems to have divided the online community, both inside the tech industry and outside of the tech industry. Some people completely get it. And like you said a few moments ago, you know, so many retailers, etc., have got no idea what's coming and just how transformative it's going to be. And then equally, it leaves a lot of people scratching their head thinking, but I still don't quite get it. So what would you say to those people that this is going to be much more than a fad? It's, it's like this. If, if you're my oldest daughter, yeah. she always wanted to play with the Jessie doll. Love Toy Story. Um, had a massive collection of, of little toys. My youngest daughter couldn't give her monkeys. She just wanted a, she wanted an iPad. She wanted digital items. She wanted interactivity. Digital is becoming more and more relevant to every generation that's moving forwards. And actually, if you think about it, you've been doing that sort of NFT sort of thing for years. When you buy, do an in-app purchase... You've been buying a digital item for yourself on your mobile phone. The only difference is that now you can own it. But if you buy it as an purchase, the second you put your iPhone down and you move to an Android, it's gone forever. So the behavior is already there. The type of things that you do are already there. It's just a case of that next step, which is separating you from the company that makes it and making it wholly your own. That's the only jump. People are buying digital assets all day long already but they're just used to existing on the iPhone or on the Android or on the PC. But this means that you can own it and it doesn't matter what tech you have, you own it forever. You can gift it to your grandchildren. It becomes something real and valuable. But, you know, the problem with crypto generally is that it's like, it can be like a cult where everyone really basks in the wonderfulness of the technology. But, you know, the mass market don't care. The mass market just wants something that works. So when you break that, barrier that's when all of a sudden everyone gets it and starts joining the sort of revolution because you have to make it easy and that's what we've done with terra virtua so if you come into our platform so coming back to your last question let's say that you want to buy an asset now what we did was let's say we do so we've got to deal with legendary pictures and godzilla versus kong was a movie that came out earlier this year so what we did was rather than just having a picture or a trading card We took the CGI special effects from the film and we used it to create these incredible animated 3D models that, you know, move. So think of it like a digital action man figure. And it's the fully animated Godzilla or Kong or Mechagodzilla, you know, millions of polygons. And we made beautiful 3D models and we made it so that people could buy them. And so you could actually go to the website, sign up without having a crypto wallet, sign up. Um, enter your details and pay by credit card. And we handled everything else, which was the NFT crypto wallet part. And we made it so that it was just nice and easy. So um, anyone could go online. They could see, wow, this is a cool 3D model. They could go ahead and buy it. And then we've got these 3D spaces. And that's why we call it an ecosystem where you've got like your own room and your own massive dome. Imagine that you can walk around on your desktop on the PC and then you can see full size Mecha Godzilla and walk around it. And that's yours. You own that. And then you can sell it and you can trade it. But it's all digital and you can view it in AR on your mobile phone. So we had people like doing TikToks and memes of Godzilla terrorizing them in their gardens. It was, it was you know, you can make it much more interactive and interesting. And that's what it is. You should be able to buy it. You should be able to trade it. You shouldn't know the first thing about crypto for it really to work in the mass market. And it's going to be more interesting than just something which is physical and a straight translation to digital. But you could never get a 3D model working in the physical world. Not like that. But that's something we sold on Terra Virtual. We spent a lot of time engineering it. I love that. And again, on this podcast, I do like busting a few myths and misconceptions. And people outside the industry, as soon as we mention words like blockchain and crypto, are going to, especially on the back of COP, COP26, are going to be thinking about, oh, yeah, but this technology is not green. It's not good for the environment. And another one of the reasons I invited you on the podcast today is I recently read that Terra Virtua is also committed to creating a sustainable NFT Ooh. ecosystem. And that statement alone will blow a few people's minds. So can you expand on that and how you're you're shifting to a a greener blockchain well we've actually so we've we've shifted so essentially what happened was that we had thousands and thousands of assets that were in ethereum so ethereum ethereum and bitcoin really are the big energy 
um, beasts at the moment. And, you know, Ethereum will get its act together. The technology is moving forwards. Um, they're changing it, you know, the, the way it's operating. It was never sort of designed to operate at the sort of scale that it operates right now. And so as a result, um, let's say creating one NFT in Ethereum is the equivalent power consumption of sending 25,000 emails. That's what it is, okay? But um, we moved to Polygon, um, which is compatible with Ethereum, and it uses up the same amount of power as sending two emails. That's the difference from 25,000 to two. And that's what Polygon do on their blockchain. So as well as working with Polygon, which is a great partner, and a lot of the NFTs in the world are now being minted on them, and it is dra using drastically less power, there's also some loads, there's also a bunch of really great uh, tier one blockchains that we're working with. And that's a, like an alternative to Ethereum. Cardano, Casper Labs are two of the guys that we're working with now. Really lovely crews, really focused on the use of power as well in terms of what they put together. And so by supporting them and using them for different areas, we sort of expand out in different directions. But what we had to do was when we moved from Ethereum to Polygon, we effectively froze all of our assets about Ethereum and took them off the marketplace. So there's an awful lot of uh, stock. We literally did the equivalent of just burning it so we couldn't use it again. And uh, we've been launching everything steadily month by month on the new green blockchain so that all the assets are completely green. Well, as green as you can get at the moment. But, um, you know, as the market matures, you'll see more and more sort of like uh, – of a green focus. But the thing that I always do sort of like uh, chuckle about, well, I'm not chuckle about, I guess, is that how much power do you think it takes to make the average toy on the shelf? From taking the piece of, from chopping down the tree from the box to melting the plastic, to doing the dye, to shipping in a plane. Like, you know, when you transport some really fine pieces of artwork, they actually get stored in the hold of a jet and flown around on their own private jet. And I'd really be interested in understand how much power that takes as opposed to minting something on the blockchain and sending it over to someone digitally. Right now, the focus is, as with any new tech, on the negatives, but actually the physical world, my God, the power consumption to make something there is huge, but just not part of anyone's narrative. No, that is so true. And I was recently thinking, well, we've just passed Halloween, and the amount of things that people buy cheap just for a couple of days, and then they yeah. all throw them away a couple of days later. <laughs> And how much did that stuff cost to produce, to ship, yeah. to ink, to mint, and send? It's going to be a lot more than a footprint, even on a standard Ethereum NFT. You know, just to transport artwork around, it's just expensive, and it's costly, and you just the carbon footprints for those are huge. But you know, this is what happens. You know, when when you've got new technology, you have you always have people who focus on different things. And that's part of what we need to do is make sure the narrative understood. But like, of course, a lot of companies don't want to have that discussion that, well, let's not focus on what else we do wrong. Let's just focus on what we're doing right. But then that's where we're, you know, when we work with brands, the brands that we're working with are very energy conscious. So we've got to make sure that what we do is focused on that. Because the last thing, last thing you want is to have something which blows up on a brand. And we're very respectful of them because you've seen it multiple times. You know, when there's a when there's a scandal associated with someone or brand sponsors, all of a sudden sponsorship gets pulled. And this is that sort of thing, but with digital. If there's a scandal around the fact that, oh my God, this is terrible for energy, then it reflects bad on the brand. So for us, it was part pragmatic and also part of our philosophy. You know, um, all of us in the team, Gary Bracey, my CEO, and everybody else, when we set up Terra Virtua, this was very much a passion project for us. This was some, um, we'd all built our own businesses. We'd all actually were quite settled with what we were, but this was something we wanted to do was to really make a legacy. So that was one of our focuses. A part of that is doing the right thing. I love that. And one of the things I always try and do on the podcast is try and educate people and bring everyone along for the ride and help increase it, uh, in adoption, of course. So with that scene set, can you tell the listeners a little bit more about how Terra Virtua is on this mission to revolutionize the way people experience digital tokens? And also, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the only place where fans can buy and own 2D, 3D or animated collectibles. Is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, there's other people that do animated collectibles, but this the, the thing about it is that, and more will be coming because our competitors are snipping at our heels, but like um, 
where we really came from, the first vision of Terra Virtua was a place where you could buy these digital assets, have real ownership, but then also take them into a metaverse where you buy a metaverse, imagine like a 3D world where you have all your stuff and you can invite all your friends and they can see what you have. Imagine you got, we've got Godfather fans and they buy this really great Godfather artwork, you know, Korean posters that haven't seen the light of day in 20 years. And you've got a bunch of fans, imagine them all exhibited in a virtual museum where you can invite everyone and they can see what you have. So all the fans come together and share what they have because everyone's a fan of something and you always have fans and collectors. And it's about that, that we really wanted to focus in on. You know, once you have this item, how can you interact with it? And the key thing was to use every digital touch point, to use mobile, to use 3D and to use VR. From day one, we booked this whole thing out so you could walk around an art gallery and see the art that you own. You could pick up a Top Gun helmet in your hands that you bought from the Top Gun movie, which is digital, and then invite your friends into your same space and let them potter around and touch the stuff and try it on and without you fear of them breaking it. Because a lot of these things, when collectors buy these things, they never leave the plastic boxes. But here you can have interaction without worry about breakages. So that's a sort of space that we sort of wanted to focus on. And that's where we feel that we're going to be different. Because right now people are just starting this... Everyone this in this year started talking about NFTs, and now this month everyone started to talk about metaverse. You know, Facebook have just rebranded themselves a meta. We built our first cut off this back in 2018, and thought, you know what, the world's not ready for it yet. So our mission is to get where we started, which is to have the most cool, interactive social space for you to share all your experiences with. Imagine, for example. If you there's a football match and you're watching the football match and while that's happening, merch is dropping as NFTs and you're taking selfies with your kids um, on your mobile phone that I was there on this day when they when they when um, this top score happened and you're taking the photos, then you get that football. And then five years from now, you've got that football in your digital room. And if you touch it, all the photos, all the selfies that you took pop up against it. Because whenever you buy anything, anything that you've got connection with, when you're at a pop concert, when you buy something, why are you buying it? You're not buying it for that T-shirt. You're buying it for that memory. And digital will allow us to actually take that to a next level. You can have photos, media associated with that item. So when you look back on things like that, you can trigger all your emotional responses as well. That's sort of what we want to do. That's sort of where we're at. And I have been reading more and more this year about how consumers are interacting and experiencing their collectibles in virtual settings and through augmented and virtual reality apps. And I think it was towards the beginning of the year, towards mid part of the year, it was NVIDIA, Roblox, Epic Games that were getting all the the headlines around uh, building a metaverse. And like you said a few moments ago, it wasn't until Zuckerberg and Facebook suddenly announced, hey, we're rebranding to Meta. I don't think anybody saw such a huge rebrand like that coming. And now it's kind of entered the mainstream and you guys have been ahead of your time for, for quite a while now. So w- what do you think about that and, and what's happened over the last uh, weeks and months? Oh, I just, I love it because it's, it's sort of it's sort of validation. Yeah. Because um, when, um, when you're there plugging away to explain it to people, we want a VR metaverse where you can you can share your stuff and you can have games experiences. It's not just, it's not just going to be NFTs. Yeah. Imagine, imagine, for example, you buy an NFT, which is a sports car, and it's like an Alfa Romeo sports car, and it's an NFT, but then you can go into the metaverse and someone can rent that sports car off you to race in a video game in the metaverse. And then if he wins the game, you can share the prize money. Imagine cool stuff like that is going to start to happen. And just it's going to just start to spontaneously happen as people find really cool ways to use the tech. And that's really where, you know, like the likes of Roblox and all of these platforms. Look at what's happening in Fortnite. You know, you're having pop concerts in Fortnite. A lot of these things happen way beyond the scope of what the developers imagined. It's a community that will make really great things happen. So seeing this happen now in the mainstream, it's good because it means that people will start thinking in that direction and seeing it less as a fringe uh, thing. But like when we launched Terra Virtual, we launched in BAFTA in the UK. And what we did, we got hold of Ready Player One two weeks before it launched and Gary was up on the stage and went, this is a two hour trailer for what we want Terra Virtual to be in the future. So that's sort of, what will happen i think it's inevitable but it's got to be happening in a responsible way because all our kids are going to be living in these worlds they already are 
you know, to an extent. They're, they're in their... Uh, they're in all of these different games. They're in the Fortnite games and they're spending more money on skins and dressing their characters up and attending concerts and doing all of these things than they are actually playing the game. They're in an immersive reality already. It's incredibly cool. And like you said at the very beginning, there's a lot of big brands out there. I've got no idea what's coming, but now it's in the mainstream. I think many are starting to think, oh, we need to get involved here. And Terra Virtua has collaborated with numerous industry leaders. A few names that I was reading about before you came on were Paramount Pictures and Legendary Entertainment, etc. They're all looking to bring the best NFT content and collaborations to their own platforms. But can you tell me more about these collaborations and, and how you're seeing adoption increasing? Um, there's a bunch of collaborations that we're working on at the moment. Unfortunately, a lot of them are at the NDA and in discussion. Yeah. Uh, but like one of the biggest ones we've got coming out is the Indian Super League, for example. So um, what happens is that normally when you go to IPs, especially when it comes to sport, there's a very narrow sort of script that you can make your NFTs from. Sometimes it's only the video, sometimes it's only the players, um, sometimes it's some of the players, sometimes it's the arenas. So we were really looking for a brand where we could get everything. So that way you can really showcase what a proper fan experience is like. So we've got those coming out begin at the end of this month onwards, and we're going to be doing the entire league. And that's that's hundreds of millions of fans of that particular of that particular league around the world. And so that's a sort of collaboration that we're looking to work on. You know, large brands with large interest, but not just movies, because sports is very, very engaging with a lot of people in different ways. But then there's all sorts of other areas, you know, that you can work with, different types of IP that resonate with different people at different ages and boundaries. And that's what we're trying to do. And so we're in discussion with a lot of different brands. We're in discussion with a lot of different types of brand. Like one of the things we did, comic books, for example. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're all geeks. So, you know, I'm a massive comic books fan. And like, um, if you look at the way that comic books work, at the moment you buy the comic book, you can read the comic book and that's, that's it. But, you know, it's great. Great stories, great mythos. And you've seen a lot of that whole upswing in the in the media with, with uh, the Marvel uh, Universe uh, movies. But what we did, for example, we created a thing called V-Play, which allowed you to create a comic book as an NFT. So you own the comic book, but then allowed you to slice the, every page so you could go back down, you could slice off layers to see what the artist initially started with. So for example, you could have a page with the bubbles and the images, and then you can just slice away all the bubbles so you can just see the artwork. Then you can slice away all the top layer of the ink of the colors and see the original inks and slice that away and see the original pencil sketches where they started from. So now all of a sudden, you've created like a brand new segment with a new experience that other people don't have. And that's why with, with Dynamite, for example, with you know, the entire comics line is something we're converting into um, NFTs. But we're doing more than just translate the comic book in a literal fashion. We're creating 3D models around the characters. We're creating these cool robots that we have, as we call V-Flex. Think of them as digital Funkos. And we've got versions of those that are, are based around their brands. And then we've got also things like V-Play. So, we are engaging multiple brands, but it's not just movie studios, but the, uh, digital publishing, sports brands. There's a whole bunch that we're negotiating with all the time. But what you do have found is that all of a sudden the market has changed. Before, it used to be a case of we're going to make the best possible experience for your fans. But now, because it's a bit of a land grab, you've got multiple IP, new brands coming out. They're just throwing millions of dollars at brands saying, hey, you know what? have X million and we'll make NFTs for you. And the brands are just trying to figure out, should I take the money and run or should I try to focus on what's best for my fans? And you do find it's like a 50-50 mix. And one of the reasons I invited you on today was to try and talk about NFTs and metaverse, etc., in a language that everyone can understand. And let's try and educate people and, and increase adoption in the space. But for your loyal community who have listened to this interview in the hope of hearing about I don't know, more plans for future growth, etc. I appreciate you are locked down to a lot of NDAs, but are, are there any teasers you can leave us with about your plans to create a, a whole new form of entertainment in 2022 yeah, and beyond? Yeah, no, I can for sure. I mean, um, the thing about it is right now we're focusing on our NFTs and our IPs and we're growing that base. We're creating incredible new experiences for the fans, but our key thing is to grow out 
the whole metaverse piece. It's all being built, enhanced, and reinstated. Even these 3D spaces we have right now, like our big fan caves and um, your rooms where you can customize and pull your NFTs, we took them out of our metaverse and put made them separate so that people could just have those experiences. What people, are, what fans are going to see is that we're going to grow out the metaverse. You're going to have cool places where you're going to have multiple fan caves, social spaces where you can um, talk with other fans and like see all the stuff. You can have groups. And also the big thing that we're going to be working with as well is there's a ton of new games coming out because like the play to earn space is exploding in crypto and that will come over to the mainstream. And we're going to be fully supporting multiple new play to earn titles that are coming out to the market so their assets can be bought on our website and they can ex- they can they can exhibit their assets in our metaverse and they can also walk from our world into other worlds that are being created right now and we're working with multiple brands and also multiple new brands that are going to be coming out to actually have one connected universe where if you want to play this cool game where you can actually earn money by playing the game, you can buy the asset on Terra Virtua and you can just walk into the game and you can play with it. You know, that's, we're going to be creating, Terra, we're going to make Terra Virtua so it can connect into multiple other metaverses. You know, Facebook talk about their metaverse. It's only one. The metaverse itself is going to be multiple people, multiple companies who've created these cool worlds. And what we're going to be aiming to do is have our stuff work across all the worlds have great a world for ourselves, but allow people to jump around and bridge all of those. And as people are building out new tiles and experiences, we're going to encourage all of that to work in ours as well. Because the biggest barrier you're going to see in the future isn't these worlds don't want to play with each other, but they can't because they're fundamentally built on different technology. So we're encouraging you know, new game brands to build their assets in their games so they'll just work in Terra Virtual and vice versa. And that's the shape of things to come. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get more interactive, but also it's got to be holistic in, in that we will work with everyone to make a wonderful experience across multiple types of games and movies and brands where everyone can have their own space. That's the sort of vision for 2022 and beyond. Wow, incredibly cool and a brilliant moment to end on. But before we do, I always like to begin my podcast talking about uh, the guest's origin story, what put them on this path. And then I also, uh, as we come full circle, like to ask them, what was the soundtrack to that origin story? Is there a song or piece of music that just accompanied you on your tech career or helps you get your head in the zone? Uh, Is there a song and a story you can share with us? And we'll we'll add that song to our Spotify playlist. Oh, my God. Um, (laughs) I guess with me, it's a bit different. Um, you know, it's it's just like, you know, I'm always interested in new technology. Yeah, I've always had new songs. So there's never one song. When I was a kid, it's like um, our parents always had the songs that they had when they're growing up and they used to play them over and over. Yeah. But in our case, I've had the same playlist as my kids growing up. So the song always changes. So there's never one theme tune, but it's always what's really fun at the time. And so I guess my song has been in a state of constant evolution. And right now I've got a bunch of TikTok tunes that are in my head that I can't get rid of. <laughs> I love that. I love how you said that, a constant state of evolution. And that is our world right now. It is. And the music's always changed as well. So for anyone listening that wants to find out more information about Terra Virtua, maybe they want to join your community. Maybe they want to ask a member of your team a question or just have a a look around. What's the best starting point for everything? Like I would um, go to our website. I would join our Telegram. Um, We've got a wonderful community. And also, you know, I'm I'm there and my my DMs are open. People can ping me anytime. You know, our, our team make a point of all the people you see on Terra Virtua. You can see us and you can reach us. You know, we're all there. We're not one of these anonymous crypto teams. We're there. And anyone's got a question, just ping us. We'll have a chat. Fantastic. Well, I'll have those links to the show notes so people can find you nice and easily. Love chatting with you about, yes, Terra Virtua and how you're committed to creating this sustainable NFT ecosystem and how NFTs, uh, how your NFTs, people buy are authenticated, certified and permanent by, by purchasing all through the blockchain. But more than anything, I think you're very personal story that you've shared the journey that you've been on and that constant state of evolution so thank you for taking the time to share that with me today and thank you very much for having me
Terra Virtua is on a mission to turbocharge fandom from art to sports, music to movies, games to comics, all with this fully immersive platform for buying, sharing, trading, exhibiting and interacting with digital collectibles. And what really excites me is how we are redefining value and what is collectible, what is valuable. Especially now the world has started shifting from that digital realm, from working to shopping, entertaining and connecting with friends and family. It feels like we're at the start of using the internet as a virtual world. And NFTs are not just an evolution of traditional collecting. It's an entirely new form of entertainment. So I'm looking forward to navigating these uncharted digital waters together. But I'm interested in what each and every one of you think about this. What excites you? What concerns you? What do you understand? What do you not understand? What experiences do you have? Whatever it is, my inbox is open to you all. You can email me at techblogwriteroutlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk if you'd like to work with me. And you can also DM me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn at Neil C. Hughes. So keep those messages coming in. I'm going to be back bright and early waiting inside your podcast feeds with another guest. But until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.